to win at RPGs, the Bro SR way, a primer. By popular demand, I've prepared this video to help tabletop role-playing game enthusiasts elevate their play. Before we get started, allow me to introduce the Bro SR, a loose collection of three to four dozen tabletop role-playing game enthusiasts who have dedicated their gaming time to elevating their own play. They do this by delving deep into the mysteries of the rule sets of their choice. It's worth pointing out that they do not have a single rule set that they approve of or that bears the Bro SR stamp of approval. And they also have looked back to the very roots of the tabletop role-playing game hobby to explore the paths not taken, to experiment with lost principles that have not been fully explored in the 40-plus years that the tabletop role-playing game hobby has been distinct from miniature war games. Today, we're going to look at three principles. The principle of adopting the proper mindset, the principle of patron play, and the principle of real-time gaming. These are the three legs of the tripod that allow you to elevate your own game. And before we get into those three principles, we should probably point out that the exact implementation of these principles will vary from table to table. These are not concrete, hard, and fast recommendations. They are simply tools with which you will construct the perfect game for your table. There may not be one specific right way to play tabletop role-playing games, but we know there are an infinite number of ways to play it wrong. What I am offering you today are the tools to discover the right way to play for you. And of course, the first principle that we have to talk about is mindset. You have to be willing to experiment to find what works best for you and for your table. You need to free yourself from the shackles of what everybody knows about RPGs to be true today. Let's take a look back at the primordial soup of tabletop role-playing games. I refer, of course, to the miniature war game hobby from which RPGs grew. Let's look at the mindset of your typical miniature war game enthusiasts. You get together for, quote, a session. And what happens? You divide up into two teams, and you're going to play a competitive war game. It is a cooperative endeavor in which you are competing against each other. These are not mutually exclusive activities. You Players on both sides know and understand the rules, and they can adjudicate this competition on their own. Although they're both trying to master the rules and trying to master the strategy and tactics of the game and put those two together in order to establish their dominance and, and have the outcome be conducive to their desires... This is not done out of a sense of aggression, but out of a sense of cooperation. At the same time, you have a third group at the table. One, and in some cases more than one, referee who stands aloof. He stands ready to step into the breach when you have a conflict that the two sides cannot successfully adjudicate. This most often occurs when you have a situation in which the fog of war arises. One of the sides wants to engage in most commonly hidden movement. He provides that information to the referee, and both sides may have hidden movement that they provide to the referee. It's important to note that the referee does not have all of the information. He doesn't know what the full aims and desires and goals and strategies of each side are. What he does have is information that both sides do not have, that only one of the sides have. And he can look at that information and he can see where the paths intersect. He can check lines of sight and he can announce to the table when the fog of war is lifted. He can see deeper into the fog of war and his role, although it is distinct from that of the generals of the war game, 
he doesn't have any more power than they do. Ultimately, at the end of the day, when you sit down to play a game with another player, you all have the same amount of power. The power to say no. The power to push away from the table and walk away. And this is part of the mindset shift, is understanding that everyone is a participant at the table. And this is something that modern role-playing enthusiasts understand. However, for some reason, they have decided that one of the players at the table needs to be granted additional power within the game. Not just the power to step into the breach when there's conflict among players. Not just the power to adjudicate fog of war, but the power to create the entire game whole cloth and to determine what the outcome of the game is, and to fool the players into thinking that they have some sort of agency to affect that outcome. He creates a campaign world. He creates a story. He creates hoops for the players to jump through. Maybe he loosens the reins a little bit, and he runs a sandbox style of game where the players can decide which of his NPCs to support which of his NPCs to oppose. But everyone at the table, all of the players, are engaged on the same team, pulling on the same rope in the same direction. They are no longer in competition with each other. They are in competition with the obstacles that are thrown at them by the dungeon master. This mindset has been very toxic to tabletop role-playing games. And in order to game the Bro SR way, you need to abandon that. You need to free the players up. You need to give them the autonomy to decide from the very beginning what direction the campaign will take. You need to give them the ability to help create the campaign world. Now, as I said, finding where the sweet spot is will vary from group to group. Some groups will embrace a very gonzo style of play. They will throw elements of science fiction into their table, post-apocalyptic. They will borrow anything from any pop culture reference that they can think of. Some tables will take on a more anime aspect as they throw anime into the game. Some tables will play a much more historical game. Some tables may prefer a prehistoric, a caveman-style game. Some tables may decide that our genre or genre or milieu, if you will, is a very grim and dark early black powder era. Flashing blades and matchlock rifles. That is for the table to decide. And if everyone decides on a genre and they can stick to those principles, then you have a wonderful opportunity for the game to arise. In fact, what happens when you establish the genre is that players will naturally gravitate towards one side of a conflict or another. Political organizations will naturally express them, suggest themselves to the players. If you are playing in a pseudo- or maybe even a historical court of the Sun King at the while the dueling blades are predominant and gunpowder has not quite come to the fore. You may play in a Three Musketeers style game. File the serial numbers off, drop it into a fantasy version of French, France, like an Averroin, if you will, and suddenly a player will get the notion that He wants to play the king's loyal guards. I need to keep the king, young and weak and stupid though he may be, on the throne. Another player may decide that the Richelieu, the scheming, underhanded religious zealot, is the order of the day. Another player may decide maybe we'll advance the revolution up by 50 to 100 years. I'm going to take on the role of a Jacobin. That player decides that he wants to try to undermine both the religious authority and the political authority by whipping up anger and resentment among the mob. And then, of course, you have your musketeers, who are the actual characters in the campaign, if you will, who are caught in the middle and have to decide one of those three sides to support. Perhaps another player decides he's going to play the role of a diplomat serving a foreign country. 
that is all too happy to foment the conflict between the three locals, the politics, the mob, and the religious authorities, because he wants to weaken the state in plans for an invasion. Suddenly we've moved on to patron play. And patron play is very simple. You allow the players to operate the machines of the higher level organizations. In classic Dungeons and Dragons terms, what this means is that one player will be assigned the Thieves Guild. One player will be assigned the Church. One player will be assigned the King's Loyal Guards. One player will be assigned a mercenary company who is present in the town and is looking to sell their services to the highest bidder. In a normal campaign, the Dungeon Master is tasked with operating the machinery of all four of those factions that I just spun up off the top of my head. In patron play, bear in mind, these are NPC organizations with goals and resources of their own. Exactly how you play those at the table is up to you. How detailed do you want to track their resources? Do you want to track every single cut purse down to the number of hit points that he has? Or do you want to run it as a CEO? Listen, the primary goal for the Thieves Guild is going to be making a little money off the top, making enough to bribe the local authorities to continue to exercise just enough crime to keep people in their place. And also keep an eye out for any renegades who are operating outside of the guild. The goal of the Thieves Guild is to make sure that the amount of corruption is just enough to never threaten the existing power structures. That's a legitimate tack to take. And then the referee will ask the player, well, how are you going to do that? And the player has to decide, am I going to use informants at the street level? Or am I going to focus my effort on tavern keepers? Am I going to bribe them for information? Exactly how that works is up to the players. This all happens in the background, away from the table. Presuming you're playing with friends, you have access to telephones. You have access to social media. And this can all operate away from the table. When you sit down at the table, the referee who has taken the information from all of the patron players now has a better grasp of what's going on in the campaign world. He knows what's going on in our not-quite-France, not-quite-Paris, not-quite-Versailles, because he has taken all of the orders from these patron players. And when he says to the PCs, the first-level musketeers, hey guys, here's a whole bunch of rumors that you have heard. Which ones do you want to chase down? Those rumors will come from the patrons. The players will already know what some of those rumors are. One of the players, who's running the Richelieu type, will understand exactly what the religious authorities are doing to undermine the political authorities. Now, he may or may not inform the other characters of that, because he is now running not just the patron, but he's also running his individual character. This allows the players, it forces them, if you will, to exercise character knowledge versus player knowledge. And where this gets very interesting is because the player is now sitting down with a character sheet in front of him, the Richelieu patron who he was running moments earlier is now an NPC. And the decisions made by that patron are decided by the GM. The GM knows the general outline and the general thrust of what that Richelieu type may be. And he may even pause to ask the player, hey, uh, what exactly did you have in mind here? And now you understand how the distinction between player and GM does not need to be as ironclad as we have understood it to be for the last 40 years. Everyone at the table becomes a GM in some aspect of that role. The man behind the GM screen 
has to put the screen down and he needs to step out of that role and offer it up to the player for that moment where the player says, yeah, Rishay Lu has a spy over there and he's trying to do X so that Y can happen. The DM picks the DM screen back up and he takes the reins back. This is that miniature wargaming mindset of cooperative competition that we're talking about. And I hope this clarifies exactly how patron play intersects with PC play. There is a balance to be struck here. One of the players may decide to push the party to work for the king. And because the king is his patron, there is the potential for abuse. And this is where the authority of the referee steps in. The player playing the weak and ineffective king, announces that the king is going to shower a million gold pieces on the PC. And everyone at the table says, hey, hold on, that's dumb. That completely ruins the adventure for everyone. The referee says, that is his plan, yes, but now that we've, we're sitting down to the table, the king has reconsidered and that's not going to happen. There are checks and balances that have to occur. There are negotiations that occur. And by this manner, the balance of the game is maintained. That's another aspect that you have to be aware of. I hope this helps you understand the how to run patron play, or at least how to approach patron play in a way that works for you. With that said, because you now have patrons that have slow developing schemes your player characters your pcs are trying to get enough gold to be able to afford a nice place to sleep full bellies a safe place to sleep and maybe upgrade some of their equipment for the next week they are looking at the short term for the most part at least at the beginning of the campaign at least until they are drawn further and deeper into the web of the politics created by the patron play the patrons are looking at things from a much higher elevation. Their schemes are going to be measured in months and years. The process by which you undermine the throne involves a lot of small subplots. Time now becomes of the essence. And this is where you begin to implement one-to-one -one timekeeping. Maybe. If all of this is too abstract and you feel the need to start with something more concrete, you can always begin by implementing one-to-one -one time at your table as part of your normal episodic play. The DM has an adventure prepared. You go on that adventure and, you under and that adventure takes however many days it's going to take. A week. Ten days. For every day that you are not sitting at the table, a day passes in the campaign world. This means that as you sit down to play in a session, you may be working ahead of the calendar. This adventure took 10 days to complete. We went, we scouted out the false front business hoping to gain insight into the operations of the Thieves' Guild so that we can put a hit on their bagman and get away with their gold and get it to the religious authorities to buy favors down the line. That adventure takes 10 days. Today is the first of the month. Your player characters will be doing that for the next 10 days of the campaign. At the end of this session... The DM may announce, look, I, I'm going out of town for three weeks, so we're not going to be able to reconvene for another session until the 21st. This leaves your PCs with 11 days to kill. The DM asks, what do you think your characters will do in the following 11 days? Will they lay low? Will they get out of Dodge? Will they move three towns over? Are they going to hide out in the monastery for sanctuary because now the Thieves Guild is looking for them? Perhaps one of your fighter types says, you know, there's a caravan that's going to be taking a six-day trip over the mountains. Why don't I go work for them for two gold a day and they'll be back in time for the next session three weeks from now? Our 10-day adventure 
a five-day journey out, a five-day journey back. I should be safe. Great. You guys sit down for the adventure three weeks from now, and that fighter is ready to go. You know what he's been doing during downtime. This is how one-to-one time works at the table. It's not that complicated, but what it opens up for you is the possibility of your PCs having lives outside of the adventures. Modern day iterations of tabletop RPGs are very rushed because you have absolute control over the passage of time. You stop. Players don't want to let go the reins of their PCs. In our example of the fighter who goes off to serve as a caravan guard, there's a chance he may die. It's a dangerous job. That's why you make 10 times what a peasant in the field makes. The DM may sit down and say, we're going to adjudicate that when I get back. There is a chance that your character will die in downtime. When you are away from the table, your character is essentially an NPC. There is no character... Excuse me. There is not a player running his actions. In consideration of that, the GM may say, but given there's a chance he may die, there's also a chance that they may be attacked by bandits and uncover the bandits' gold. So while he's on a 10-day mission that pays ostensibly 20 gold pieces, there's a chance he may die. We'll roll a percentile. There is a 5% chance he dies, but there is also a 5% chance that he successfully defends the caravan and earns himself a 50 gold piece bonus. Let's roll the dice at the start of the next session. The dice will determine the outcome. That character is now an NPC. A week and a half later, or 10 days later, the adventure is over and you sit down on the 10th and another player says, hey, you know what? I got a great idea for an adventure. Why don't we actually play out that 10-day mission for that caravan guard. And the same player says, yes, I'd love to. You run a session with a different DM who knows what's going on in the mountain pass over the mountains where the goblin tribes are active and the goblins attack and we run a little adventure with a different GM. And then you come back and when the first GM comes back from his business trip and says, let's roll the dice. And you say, no, time out. We went ahead and ran that adventure on our own. It was a lot of fun. It turns out he killed a bunch of goblins and scored himself a big fat bonus. And not only that, but he scored a couple of magic items. Again, be reasonable. You have to ensure that everyone understands that everything was operated fairly. You play the game according to the rules so that when you come back and you offer this player character to the original GM, he trusts that you have not abused the liberty and the freedom that you have to engage in tabletop play away from the rest of the campaign because ultimately there is no rest of the campaign. Exactly what happens with that caravan guard, maybe the goblins are stirred up now. And this provides an opportunity for the religious authority to blame the king for antagonizing the goblins which are now raiding the outlying farms, which stirs up the peasants and plays into the hands of the Richelieu type. Every little thing that you do can be fed back into the patron style of play. But it becomes difficult to track if you're not using real time, what we call Jeff Rogaxian timekeeping. Now that the religious authorities understand the goblins have been stirred up, well, they're not going to be stirred up, remember, until the 16th of the calendar. So, or perhaps even the 20th. So they are now going to make plans. And a new player comes along and says, ooh, let me run the goblin clans. Now it's going to take them a month to get their clans together. Now there's a rumor in the campaign, thanks to the player deciding that he's going to gather the goblin clans, that something must be done about the goblins. The natural and organic progression of the campaign is allowed by everyone stepping back and treating the campaign world as a whole, as a collective toy in which each player has the autonomy to create and direct. Yes, there's some negotiation. But again, the the subject of this particular principle is one-to-one time. 
And the whole point of making our example as complicated as possible is helping you understand the benefits of one-to-one timekeeping. You now have time to consider the ramifications of not just that first adventure on the Thieves Guild, but also the ramifications of the caravan guard stirring up the goblin clans. And you've got a month to prepare for the goblin raiding parties coming into town. By allowing the campaign to progress at one day for every day that passes in the real world, you have a universal resource that everyone accrues at the exact same rate. You each get one day of opportunity for one day in the real world. All three of these feed into each other. And if I've presented this to you properly, you will see how they are three legs of a tripod that will lift your game up to a higher level. All of your dreams of a complicated Game of Thrones, if you will, or Dune style faction game can be implemented at your table. If everyone gets a faction, everyone gets one day per day, and everyone gets to participate. The complexities that you as a table can handle collectively are infinitely greater and deeper and more rewarding than those that can be invented and managed by a single player called the master. Change your mindset. Play multiple levels of the campaign simultaneously. Well, off and on, if not simultaneously. And allow the game to progress at a natural and organic one day at a time. If you implement these three principles, experiment with them. Find the limits of what your table enjoys. Find how you can negotiate to find the sweet spot where everyone is satisfied with what's going on and your games will become so rich and so deep you will never want to go back to the old style of modern RPGs again. In fact, you'll wonder how you ever stomached that style of play. I hope this helped. Go forth and do likewise. And if you do, make sure you stop by the comment section. Let me know what you're doing. Tell me how it's working out for you. If you try something and it doesn't work and you completely face plant, let us know. Warn us about those pits and snares along the paths to gaming greatness so that we don't fall into those pits either. It's the bro thing to do and... If you do manage to avoid them all, we love to hear about the success of our brothers. Until next time, I'm praying for you.